Years ago, I read the story of Joel Treadway, Christian, married, had an adopted child, and his little girl, Sarah, had had open heart surgery as an infant. So Joel and his wife, Lena, thought they knew what to expect when they were offered a second child, Seth, who also had heart problems. Joel and Lena agreed to care for Seth, not even knowing if he would live. They saved his life several times with CPR, and they spent long, anxious hours in the hospital. In between, they gave him their love and treated him as normally as possible. Joel convinced himself, despite the continuing medical problems, that Seth would grow and thrive. But Lena was more realistic. Once, during a difficult time, Lena remembers giving Seth a big bear hug and asking, do you know how much I love you? He returned the hug and said, I love you too, Mommy. And Lena went on, do you know how much Jesus loves you? Yeah, I know, he replied. Mommy, Jesus is here. He's right over there. She followed her son's gaze. I never saw anything, she says. But I had no doubt that Seth could. A few weeks later, Seth died in his sleep. Lena and their daughter grieved, but Joel was devastated. He couldn't believe a loving God would do this. He went quickly from denial to sorrow to anger, and he stayed angry. He shut out his wife and daughter, buried himself in his work, and he shut out God. For more than a year, he stayed inside the shell. After a while, he knew that something needed to change, but he couldn't summon the courage to bridge the gap that he created. And then he attended a Promise Keepers Conference. This was a number of years ago. And he went to this Promise Keepers Conference, and the final speaker was James Dobson. He was supposed to talk about when God doesn't make sense. And that was what Joel thought he needed to hear. But Dobson changed his topic, and he talked about what your wife wants me to tell you. It was that new topic that finally broke Joel's heart he realized how miserably uncaring he had been in his grief. When his wife and family needed him most, he simply hadn't been there. He asked God to forgive him and to help him get his life back in balance, and he vowed to do whatever it took to prove to his wife and child, wife and daughter, how important they were. Seth doesn't need me anymore, he said. He's in heaven with Jesus, it's Lena who needs a husband and Sarah who needs a father. So he hurried home, grabbed up his wife in his arms and held her, and he says, I guess she knew right then that something had happened. So the couple worked through their grief. They gave themselves more than ever to Sarah. They learned a new dependence on God, and finally they found a new peace. So that's a good story. But what I want is for us to begin here to recognize a pattern. So, so Joel is tormented. He's tormented by the episode and the loss of his son. And that torment leads him into sin, into anger, workaholism, whatever else. But then comes an encounter. For Joel, it was on a Promise Keepers conference, but it was really an encounter with Jesus. And from that encounter came a new perspective. He saw his problems with a more realistic view, saw how he had acted in his grief toward those around him. And finally, there was a sharing of that, the, the testimony of what God had done and what God was doing to restore that family. Okay, so the same pattern is seen in a very different circumstance in today's text. Luke 8, 26 to 39. I, I think it's a biblical pattern of renewal in people's lives, that an encounter with Jesus turns our torment into testimony. And the first part of the pattern is a torment or a trial or a tribulation of some sort. Here's Luke 8, 26 to 29. Then they sailed to the country of the Gerasenes, which is opposite Galilee. When Jesus had stepped out on land, there met him a man from the city who had demons. 
for a long time he had worn no clothes and had not lived in a house but among the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell down before him and said with a loud voice, What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I beg you, do not torment me. For he had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. For many a time it had seized him. He was kept under guard and bound with chains and shackles, but he would break the bonds and be driven by the demon into the desert. So last week we looked at the episode where Jesus calmed the storm on the Sea of Galilee. Now the disciples and Jesus have completed their crossing and they land on the east side of the lake. The actual place where they landed is a bit disputed. There's a town called Garasa in the Decapolis, but it's more than 30 miles away from the Sea of Galilee. There's also a town called Gadara, somewhat closer to the lake, and there is yet another town which may have been called Gergasa, but is known as Kersi, and that's where those pictures were taken. It, it may be that whatever town was mentioned, or region even, whatever was mentioned in the original was such a little known place that the scribes began to substitute other better known places, creating the confusion in the manuscripts. In any event, what's important to notice is not the specific point on the map, but the fact that this was now Gentile territory. The entire Decapolis and all the territory on that side of the lake belonged to the Gentiles. So this garrison man was almost certainly a Gentile, and yet Jesus has compassion on, on him. So now one of the things in this text that really stands out is how horrible this man's position really was. He was demon-possessed. His actions and his spirit were under the domination of demons, representatives of the enemy of Satan, themselves fallen spiritual beings whose goal is to work evil and promote it. And like most evil, the possession of this man is both degrading and spiteful. The demons were mean-spirited. They wouldn't even let the man wear clothes or live in a house but drove him out into these tombs and death. And though he was occasionally chained hand and foot, kept under guard, the demons broke those chains, drove him into the wilderness, and made him alone. It's characteristic. Characteristic of Satan when he's at work in any one of the ways we'll describe. But when Satan's at work, people become more like animals than like men and women made in the image of God. Wherever you find evil, you almost always find filth, brutality, ugliness, human degradation, and pain. The disgrace of human sexual trafficking around the world, and even in our country, has all of these horribly ugly characteristics. But it's not just demons who incite this. I mean, Satan does promote ugliness directly, but our fallen world and our fallen sinful nature cooperate in that ugliness. This evil deeply impacts others, tragedizes, which I guess might be a word, and anyway, it tragedizes our most significant relationships. Nonetheless, as Kat said, when these awful demons come face to face with Jesus, they recognize that they are in the presence of a far greater power than theirs. So they take this man and make him fall at Jesus' feet, shouting at the top of his voice, what have you to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? Whenever that phrase, God most high, or the most high God is used in the Old Testament, it is a recognition of God's sovereignty, his inherent right and power to rule and to judge. And the demons recognize that sovereign power in Jesus. They know that he can effortlessly decide their judgment and seal their fate. And in doing so, they answer the question the disciples had asked after Jesus calmed the storm. They had said, who is this man that even the winds and the waves obey him? Who is this man? 
this Jesus? He is the Son of the Most High God. He is the one with authority over wind, waves, and demons. Now, I want us to think a bit about these horrible demons that Jesus so often encountered. The question is how much we as believers ought to be concerned about demons. So to gain biblical insight into this, we have to notice first that the vast majority of explicit demonic activity in the biblical record occurs in the Gospels and the first chapters of Acts. Only in these places, during the ministry of Jesus and shortly after, does the explicit influence of demons on individuals reach its peak. In fact, there are three distinct periods of biblical history related to how Satan carried out his main destructive work. In the Old Testament, we don't see the explicit work of demons, but we see an incredible, excuse me, English, an incredible amount of destructive and sinful influence by idols. The whole Old Testament mentions demons only twice, but it mentions idols hundreds and hundreds of times. So in that epoch, Satan chose to array his forces against men mainly by making his minions into false gods for the people to worship and thus to drag away the people of God. And his fingerprints are all over this, the degradation, the stench of idol worship so that people even offered their own children in the burning fires of Moloch. Now in the last part of the Old Testament, it is not idols or demons that seem to take center stage. Rather, it is the fallen human nature, the old man that causes most of the problems as believers. Again, Satan is trying to drag away God's people. Believers now battle with what had been enemy territory before they were redeemed, the now defeated but not exiled sinful nature. This is why Paul emphasizes putting off the old man and putting on the new. The battleground has become the lust of the flesh and the evil desires of the heart. So the three periods I see are first idols, then demons, then desires. Does this mean Satan's limited to just one of these in any given age? No. This is just his emphasis. He continues to work through idols and demonic activity in different cultures in the world, in our own culture at times, and in different points in time. At times, he'll even take one of those things and disguise it as something else. So that sometimes, when our culture sees mental health, we may actually be seeing demonic activity. And yet, he's also at work in the larger sphere to corrupt the world system, to create an environment where morality is more and more optional, and where the subjective choice, the self-actualization of people is made the highest good. I, I believe it is Satan who stands behind the conviction that we all at times struggle with that no one has the right to tell me what to do. Because in that environment, he can not only harden non-believers, but more importantly, he can tempt believers to live according to the old sinful nature. All these things work together. But I believe that our concern as believers, ought to be primarily to live in Jesus according to the new nature, the redeemed nature. And if you read the rest of the New Testament, beginning with the letters from Romans 1.1 1, 1 to 3 John, you'll find that this living by the Spirit, living by the new nature, is the overwhelming concern of the New Testament writers. But this poor man, possessed by a legion of demons, is the classic image of Satan's way of doing business in Jesus' day. And, and Luke's simple description allows us to sense his torment. Trapped by these demons into awful behaviors, awful ways of living. This is, in fact, the link that, size, that ties all of Satan's stuff together. When, when we see inhumanity, ugliness, suffering, and death, we see Satan's playground. 
when we see people hating their own addictions or lusts or angers, we see the suppressed man in another form. When we see people suffering from oppression or from the lust and anger of others, we see the torment that Jesus had compassion on here. When we hear Satan's siren song of death by murder, abortion, suicide, or euthanasia, we hear the enemy laugh. But it is this torment, this suffering, this oppression that sets the stage for God to act, sets the stage even today for an encounter with Jesus. Watch what happens in this text, Luke 8, 30 to 33. Jesus then asked him, what is your name? And he said, Legion, for many demons had entered him. And they begged him not to command them to depart into the abyss. Now a large herd of pigs was feeding there on the, excuse me, on the hillside, and they begged him to let them enter these. So he gave them permission. Then the demons came out of the man and entered the pigs, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and drowned. Up to this point in the text, the voice of the man has spoken in the first person, singular. What do you want with me? Don't torture me. So it's a little bit surprising when we find that there are many demons oppressing this man. So many demons have caught into him that they called themselves legion. Roman legion was three to 6,000 soldiers. And even if not exact the term, represents a tremendous number of demons. Recognizing Jesus for who he is, son of the most high God, the demons also knew that he had the power to destroy him. They feared that he would send them into the eternal abyss, the bottomless pit where they would be held until a final judgment. Same place, by the way, that Satan himself will be bound for a thousand years near the end of the book of Revelation. But she's Excuse me. Jesus chooses not to send them there, though he could have. I, I, I don't know why he doesn't. But when they beg him to be sent into the herd of pigs, he allows it. By, by the way, the presence of this large herd of pigs shows this was Gentile rather than Jewish territory. And yet even in the pigs, the demons are not at peace. They, they, they incite this herd into a huge panic and it rushes off the bank and down into the lake where all the pigs drowned, which I believe is just another example of Satan's habit of ugliness and destruction. Our enemy always wants, as Jesus says in John, to kill, hurt, and destroy. People ask, what happened to the demons after that? I don't know not told. The focus, as always in the Gospels, is on the people. So in this brief encounter with Jesus, the man now has been set free from oppression. oppression. The word of Jesus, the bare word of Jesus, is powerful for setting free. Where this man had been oppressed by a legion, now they're all gone. So this is the second stage of the process. When you are in torment, whether the torment caused by your own sin or any kind of trial or suffering, the resolution comes from an encounter with Jesus and his word. He is the only one who can free you from the guilt of sin. He is the only one who can take the burden of your suffering, and nothing daunts him. He is Lord, sovereign over every created thing, powerful over every foe. Martin Luther knew it, as we sang earlier. Did, did you hear these words? A mighty fortress is our God, a bulwark never failing. Our helper, our helper he, amid the flood of mortal ills prevailing. For still, our ancient foe does seek to work us woe, his craft, his power great and armed with cruel hate on earth is not his equal. Did, did we in our own strength confide? Our striving would be losing. We're not the right man on our side, the man of God's own choosing. Do you ask who that might be? Christ Jesus. It is he, the Lord of hosts, his name, from age to age the same, and he 
must win the battle. That's the Lord we see in this scripture. And the question, of course, is, have you had an encounter with Jesus in the midst of oppression by the sins of your fallen nature? Have you had an encounter with Jesus? In the torment of your guilt, have you had an encounter with Jesus? In the trial of your suffering, have you had an encounter with Jesus? Now, I'm not trying to set up something mystical here, although I'm trying to set up something emotionally riveting, but, but this isn't mystery. It starts with a simple realization that you are sinful, that you are tormented, that you are suffering, that you are in need of his compassion, that in love he gave himself for you. Jesus redeems you. He came to free you. He came to heal and rescue you. And the realization that by faith alone, by trust alone, you, you cry out for that rescue by trusting in him. That's the simple basis of our rescue is that trust. And yet for most people, Jesus does give depth to that encounter. He, he reaches in to our broken hearts and he pours out love that frees us and enables us to praise, honor, and worship him because he is the sovereign rescuer over every torment. And an encounter like that has tremendous consequences. The man's whole life is turned around. He's freed from oppression to focus on Jesus. Luke 8, 34 to 36. When the herdsmen saw what had happened, they fled and told it in the city and in the country. Then people went out to see what had happened. And they came to Jesus and found the man from whom the demons had gone, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. And those who had seen it told them how the demon-possessed man had been healed. Okay, so the key point in these three verses is what the people see when they come to check out this event. They find this man from whom the demons had gone, sitting at Jesus' feet, clothed, and in his right mind. Sanity is found in sitting at Jesus' feet. I can't think of four better words to describe the life of a rescued believer. <laughs> sitting at Jesus' feet. And, and it means sitting there to listen to what he says. It, it means learning from him and not from any of the other sources shouting at us. When we're under the torment of sin, when we're under suffering, we tend to only hear what the world has to say or the lies that we say in our own heads. We have a warped perspective, a self-centered perspective, a self-justifying or often self-condemning perspective, well, when we sit at Jesus' feet, we get Jesus' perspective. We hear his word, his heart, his truth. Jackie Hill Perry, whom I've mentioned before, was a young woman deeply committed to a lesbian life. When she encountered Jesus, everything changed, and yet she had to learn to sit at his feet, and a woman named Santeria became her disciple. This woman, Jackie says, showed me that knowing God was more than knowing about him, doing things for him, but knowing him. We come through trial, we come through testing, we encounter Jesus, and then we sit at his feet learning to know him. And, and the first way that happens is by hearing and doing his word. And it also happens through worship. We worship, the psalmist says, at his footstool, at his feet. We, we kneel there and praise him from the overflow of our hearts for his greatness, his power, his love, and his rescue. And finally, sitting at Jesus' feet means having him as first priority. When I'm sitting there, I'm not doing any of the other things that I might be doing. I'm not, I'm not following my own interests. I'm not making my own use of the time. I'm not pursuing my own wealth, my own power, my own pleasure, 
my own rest, like Mary of Bethany, listened in her, at his feet while his sister fretted, we choose that better part despite the busyness that our world drives us toward. After an encounter of Jesus, with Jesus, you get this whole new perspective. And it's called sanity. This man is in his right mind. You see, if God is really the sovereign God of the universe, if his will is its law, then any perspective on reality other than God's perspective is insanity. It's insanity. Jackie Hill Perry tells a story that illustrates God making her sane, seeing the world from his perspective. She apparently, even after she was a believer, had the habit of getting up and getting right on social media. But one day, Santoria left her a book, and on it was a little yellow sticky, and it said, before you get on the computer, study chapter two. Chapter two was called Humility coming to God on his terms. So what does this have to do with me, Jackie thought. I sat down on the couch behind me and started to read. What I read had knives in it, sharp, stainless steel ones, stopping only when a period or paragraph break made, me, made them sit still. Some words were shards of a mirror. Each cut showed me what my heart had tried to keep from God. Each sentence told me that pride was not exclusive to the outwardly arrogant people I'd come across, but it also sat inside all of us, inside me, only to be discovered when the sword of the spirit pierced through the bone and marrow that housed it. That's the return to sanity, seeing things from God's perspective. And in the same way, this man, after encountering Jesus, was in his right mind. He had gotten a dose of God's reality, God's perspective, God's power, and it had straightened out his thinking. He no longer heard the lies of the enemy. Now, you may have noticed, some of you probably have, that we are living in an insane asylum. That the only point of sanity to be found in this whole demented world around us is in Jesus Christ, who is the truth. So we encounter Jesus, and then we cling to Jesus, cling to his word, sit at his feet, and find the sanity we long for. But it actually doesn't stop there. There's one more step in this process of renewal, and that's testimony telling others how much God has done and what God does. Look at verses 37 to 39. Then all the people of the surrounding country of the Gerasenes asked him to depart from them, for they were seized with great fear. So he, Jesus, got into the boat and returned. The man from whom the demons had gone begged that he might be with him. But Jesus sent him away, saying, Return to your home and declare how much God has done for you. And he went away proclaiming throughout the whole city how much Jesus had done for him. The people of the town didn't see the compassion of Jesus in this great miracle that he performed. Rather, they saw Jesus as a threat and someone to be feared. Maybe it was an economic threat. You know, what is it going to do to our next flock, herd, whatever? Maybe it was a spiritual threat. Maybe it was just the fear of this obvious display of power. But these people come up to him, and rather than falling at his feet, they beg him to leave. That's insane. The crowd is not in their right minds. They're stuck in a misperception of reality that comes when you buy the world's view rather than God's view. But the man who was possessed, say, has a right now. He wants to go with Jesus. He wants to stay with Jesus as the focus of his life. But Jesus has something else in mind for him. Return home, he says, and declare how much God has done for you. The pattern of renewal here is completed with testimony, with telling how much God has done. Now, I admit, there's several times in the Gospels when Jesus tells people not to tell what God has done, 
to, to be quiet about a miracle or a changed life. But if you look at those times, you'll find that they all occurred on Jewish soil where the expectation of a conquering Messiah King was extremely high, and Jesus wanted to squelch those expectations. But now he's on Gentile soil. There's no danger that the people here will make him their king, and so his command to this man, as it is to us, is go and tell. And the man is obedient. He shares his testimony to what Jesus has done all over that town. I don't want to speculate, but I strongly suspect that when the news of Jesus' resurrection reached that town the following year, there were many in that town who were ready to believe this man's testimony was used by God to prepare others for faith because that's the effect when we have the boldness to tell what Jesus has done for us. Yeah, we can get into arguments over the truth of our doctrine, but we cannot, people cannot deny the testimony of our experience. We need both. We need the good news. We need the message to share, but we also need reality. We need the sanity, the reality, the transformation of that message in our own lives. So that's what I think we've seen in these verses. It's, it's a pattern of renewal. And I, I believe this pattern is typical of the way God works. Let me just run through it one more time so it's nailed in your mind. It starts out with some kind of torment, tribulation, trial from the guilt of our sin or the burdens of our suffering in a fallen world. We try to bear those things alone, too insane to turn to God. But then we have an encounter with Jesus. He will not leave us alone. He wants to challenge our unbelief. He wants to carry our burden for us, and he'll use a person or a circumstance especially the word itself, to bring us broken into his presence, falling at his feet. And it's that encounter with Jesus that restores our sanity. We are freed from the oppression, and we find peace sitting at his feet. Therefore, we want to tell others. Got to, got to tell someone. Got to share what God has done for us. We testify to him, to these people, about him, about his power, about his love, about his rescue, and the good news that we have found in Jesus. Now, I hope by this time you've noticed something. You know that I'm not a big guy for acronyms, but this sermon has one. Tribulation, encounter, sanity, testimony, test. Where are you in your current test? Are you on a trial? burdened by your guilt? Or have you had an encounter with Jesus? As a result, have you returned to sanity? And have you told others what Jesus has done? I, I think it's a biblical pattern. As, as I think about biblical characters like David and Peter and, and even Jonah, you see this pattern in their lives. In fact, as an exercise, you might want to look for this pattern in the life of David. 2 Samuel 11 and 12, Psalm 32, Psalm 51, reflected in many other places, all the elements are there. His torment or trial, encounter, sanity, and testimony. But this is an also a pattern in God's work today. I've seen it in my life. You may have seen it in your life. You may need to experience this today. You may have a test a trial that you're going through. <laughs> you may need an encounter with Jesus today. And my prayer is that you will be a testimony, a sane, saved testimony to God's renewing work.